Today I wanted to show you the drive inverter that I built for my electric vehicle. This is a 90 kilowatt BFD that's running a Siemens AC induction motor. And I'll kind of show you the inner workings of it and show you some of the early clips I have of me going through the learning process of how to spin an AC induction motor. So this is the drive inverter that I built. That gray box is an off-the-shelf one horsepower VFD and I'm using that hardware software platform as a firing circuit for a much larger IGBT stack. I wanted to keep the look of the VFD the same as it looks in the manual so it would appear a little more legitimate when I had the car inspected. So everything in the black box below is what I built. Uh, those two yellow cables are the battery leads, so that's 300 amps at 330 volts DC. And the orange cables are the three phase power cables going to the motor. And I have water cooling, so the two black lines you see there are coolant lines that go to the chill plate that keep the IGBTs cool. Those two current transducers are used as feedback for the VFD to properly magnetize and control speed and torque of the motor. So I literally took a sawzall and cut out the power stage of the off-the-shelf VFD. And you can see here that those are the lines from the gate drivers down to my new IGBT stack. The IGBTs are size 68X in current, and I scaled the feedback down by 68X. So this one horsepower drive thinks it's still putting out one horse, even though it's putting out over 100 kilowatt. On top are all the analog and digital inputs and outputs and a connection for the encoder. One of the analog inputs is used for the throttle pedal and a digital input is used for the brake switch. And some of the other I.O. is also used for pre-charging the drive and interlocking with the charge cable so I can't drive the car with the cable plugged in. Here's a schematic showing all the connections to my VFD. So the software in the VFD that I hacked has three modes of operation. The most simple is volts per hertz mode. One step up in complexity from there is sensorless vector. And the most complicated and the most sophisticated is closed loop vector mode. And when I was going through the learning process of building the inverter, I started with the simplest, which is volts per hertz. And in that mode, the inverter basically just puts out a fixed ratio of voltage and frequency. So a typical motor would be 60 hertz at 230 volts to run at its base speed. If you want to run slower than that, it just cuts the frequency in half and the voltage in half. It's always a fixed ratio. And I can show you a video of that now. Um, kind of going through the learning process and getting that mode to work first. And as I turn my pre-charge circuit on, you can uh, watch the voltage on the DC bus increase. I have my IGBT wired to my so it turns on when I increase the voltage of the pot and turns off when I decrease the voltage. So I'm going to disconnect the pot, turn the voltage up, and now I'm just going to give it a pulse. It turns on and stays on. I can turn the pot back off, and as soon as I flip this, the light turns off. After mastering switching the IGBT on and off, the next step was to pulse width modulate the IGBT to dim a lamp. And the next step from there was to probe the VFD that I had and find the pins that were triggering the IGBTs to make the modified sine wave. So that's what you're seeing on the screen there is the top half of a sine wave. And in the next video you'll see my first attempt at spinning a motor with uh, with the larger IGBTs. <laughs> Looks like I blew a fuse. So that mistake actually fried the IGBTs, but I learned from my mistakes. I had too much inductance between the DC bus caps and the IGBTs, which uh, caused some voltage spikes to exceed the voltage rating of the IGBTs. Uh, so on to round two. My external IGBT, which is wired into the old circuit board for the BFD that I'm using. And as you can see, it works. Now that I got the small motor running, the next step was to get the larger motor running. 
And one of the problems with that is the motor had no nameplate. I didn't know any of the characteristics of the motor, so it was really a trial and error to, to get those numbers dialed in. All right, well, my motor's turning. I have the cables plugged into my IGBT, and I have my DC bus with all my capacitors. So. With the success of spinning the traction motor off my VFD, I finally decided to install the VFD and the transmission into the car and I bought 25 Optima blue top lead acid batteries to use for testing so that I can actually put a full load of a car and continue testing. Okay, I finally got my homemade drive working. The yellow cables are for the battery and the orange cables are going to the motor. And I also have a garden hose hooked up to keep the heat sink cool. And I can make it run. And it's a lot smoother. I don't know if you can hear it on the video or not, but it sounds really smooth. Okay, we're rolling. So we're uh, test driving the second version of the, the motor controller that I built. And this one uh, is using the latest firmware and the latest hardware that's available. Uh, the previous drive was using something I bought on eBay for about 35 bucks. And I can use the gas pedal now. So once I had volts per hertz mode working, I knew that all the electronics was okay. I was ready to move on to the next mode, which is senseless vector. And that would give me torque control, which is really needed to, to make an electric vehicle feel like a normal car. And for that mode to work, it needs two current transducers for feedback. And that basically allows the VFD to characterize the motor. Uh, you go through an auto-tune process where the drive inverter will spin the motor up and measure feedback and kind of make a lookup table of the magnetizing current and the torque producing current and it uh, kind of makes a, a flux map of the motor. Take three. Oh, gotta take the e-brake off too. That will help. So I have sensorless vector mode working and that allows me to control torque and speed where my previous inverter only let me control speed. So my throttle pedal now controls motor torque. So I step on the gas pedal, it drives like a normal car, and I can get up some speed, let off the throttle, the motor will just coast. That lets me shift into second gear. And instead of coasting, I can also do regenerative braking. So this is my DC bus voltage. when I turn the regen brakes on. Voltage is getting put back into the battery. And this is the speed feedback. This is the actual motor RPM. And I'm in first gear. You have full throttle, yeah? Yeah, it's full throttle. Part of the process of tuning the motor involved using this little netbook connected to the VFD and the firmware or software that runs in the VFD has a built-in trend chart function where you can plot a bunch of variables against time so part of that process was plotting things like magnetizing current, motor current, motor RPM, basically applied a bunch of variables against time and I would stop on the side of the road and give it full throttle and see how quickly the speed would ramp up, how quickly the current would ramp up, monitor the current for stability, if there was a certain RPM range where the, the current would go unstable, I had lookup tables where I could dial down the, the gains on the, those PID loops. And yeah, basically it was just a lot of throttle mashing and doing trend charts. And then I'd get to the point where I could start doing them up my driveway and see how quickly I could accelerate up the driveway, you know, from zero to 10 miles an hour. 
Um, and I can show you a couple of trend charts starting from uh, early on, which I would call the worst ones, to the point where it was finally getting tuned to be kind of smooth and refined. This is one of the earliest graphs I could find a screenshot of, and you can see I started out at about 230 amps. The uh, blue line is current, the red line is motor RPM, the magenta line is DC bus voltage, that's battery voltage, and the light blue line is throttle position. And this is one of the latest graphs I could find where I'm right at the 300 amp limit of the IGBTs. And I was kind of obsessed with maintaining that high current and having a smooth current throughout the RPM range. This shows a 0 to 60 of about 15 seconds, which sounds slow, but this was using only second gear. So in that power band, it, it really felt like it was pulling pretty good. Okay. I drove in Senso's Vector for several years, driving 100 miles a day from my house to Palo Alto and back. And for the most part, it worked great. Um, where it kind of fell short was if I was going up a steep hill. Um, starting from a stop going uphill, the driving dynamics has changed. There's a lot more load on the motor. And Senso's Vector, it always just follows the same ramp up. Uh, so with the encoder, it can actually measure the speed of the rotor and apply the right amount of, of slip to the motor. The slip speed is basically how fast the drive is spinning the magnetic field in the stator and how fast the rotor is spinning. So that difference in relative speed is what produces torque. And so with an encoder on the rotor, it knows exactly how fast to rotate the magnetic field in the stator. Another benefit to having the encoder is if I have a drive fault, the drive can pick up right where it left off. I don't have to come to a complete stop like I would with senseless vector. And I would get drive faults occasionally if I got wheel slip, if I drove over some wet grass or wet leaves and the wheels you know, suddenly spun really fast and then grabbed traction, that would uh, almost always cause a drive fault. One of the tests I always did in, in trying to tune the motor at low speeds was going up my driveway. You can see here, even if I'm rolling back, I can give it a little throttle and it'll climb back up the driveway. That's something I could never do without the encoder installed. I chose a shaft mounted encoder disc rather than a body encoder uh, because it was just too difficult to find one that was rated for 9,000 RPM. This is the keypad that goes with the VFD. I have an extension cord run so I can mount it inside the car and I can kind of see it while I'm driving. One of the features I have is if the drive faults, it will store the RPM or the miles per hour of when that fault occurred and I can go back into my lookup tables and either decrease the current or modify the, the PID tuning parameters for that RPM range. I program the regen brakes to work off the brake pedal if I just want enough regen brake to maintain speed going downhill, I tap the brake. If I want strong regen, I keep my foot on the brake and that will do about 30 kilowatts of braking power. I can change the switching frequency, the PWM frequency of the drive. 3 kilohertz is audible, um, but it gives more power. I can run 9 kilohertz and have it completely silent, but the drive runs a little bit hotter. And these Boosts are current boosts for a certain RPM range. It's kind of a lookup table. Well, that about wraps it up for this video. Uh, hopefully you guys got something out of it. Hopefully you were interested in inverters before you watch this, otherwise it would be incredibly boring. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to leave me some comments. Thank you.